So it's with great pleasure I now introduce our panel of American icons, the Tuskegee Airmen. The moderator of our panel is Mr. Ron Jackson. Mr. Jackson is a third generation military man who's currently a tour guide at the U.S. Capitol, but formerly a proud paratrooper in the 82nd Airborne Division. I've, um, I'm from North Carolina, so we're exceptionally proud of, uh, of the 82nd and uh, their actions over at Fort Bragg. We like to tell people we are the most military friendly state in the nation and we'd work really hard to, uh, to live up to that. But, so without any further ado, Mr. Jackson, you're on. Thank you very much. Thank you and good morning. Welcome to the William G. McGowan Theater, and we're here to salute American icons, the Tuskegee Airmen. Please allow me to briefly introduce the panel, and then we'll come back and hear from our panelists, and then we'll ask the field to give questions. I may recite the question a time or two, just for clarity. Uh, let's first begin with the person closest to me, uh, with the blue cap, Lieutenant Colonel Robert Friend, Next to him, Lieutenant Colonel Harold Brown, Lieutenant Colonel George Hardy, Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Jefferson, Lieutenant Colonel James H. Harvey III, and our closer, Lieutenant Colonel Harry Stewart. Let's first begin with Lieutenant Colonel Robert Friend, who was born in Columbia, South Carolina. Uh, his father fought in World War I. So what we'll do is, uh, Colonel Friend, sir, we'll yield the floor to you, and then we'll ask uh, our friends in the audience to give you questions. So uh, let's have a round of applause for our first panelist, <laughs> Mr. Friend. So Colonel Friend, just give us uh, just some brief history about you and just uh, your accounts in the military, well, and then we'll um, field talk. I was always interested in flying. And when the chances were offered me, I took some rather greedily. For instance, uh, I had a pilot's license in the late 30s because I was a part of, of a program that the United States was doing in defense, and uh, potential defense of itself. And that was to train people to fly airplanes as they were doing in Europe. And uh, so when time came for us to go to Tuskegee, I was more than prepared and uh, I enjoyed it very much. The one thing that I would like to clarify from my personal standpoint, everybody says Tuskegee, the place where they trained the, the uh, African Americans. That's the wrong way, I think, to look at it. The right way to look at it is that was the place where we, they trained people who were not white. You could be anything else. And so I went through the program and uh, went through three wars and feel very, very fortunate to be able to be here to speak to you people and to let you know how we felt. Thank you. Thank you. Would anyone like to ask a question of Colonel Friend? If so, please stand. I would like to make note, uh, given the bio that you see on the screen and for our audience that may be streaming, uh, if I may, uh, veteran of 142 combat missions with the Tuskegee Airmen and wingman to the unit's leader and the first African-American general in the Air Force, Benjamin O. Davis, Jr. Yesterday was the anniversary of Benjamin O. Davis, Sr. Uh, receiving his one star on uh, October 25th, 1940. There's very few of us in this audience that remember 1940, yet our panel does. Okay. 
All right, so let's introduce Lieutenant Colonel Hurl Br Brown from um, Minneapolis, Minnesota, whose father also fought in World War I. So Colonel Brown, would you give us just a, a brief history of, you, of uh, some of your uh, events in the military, please, sir? Certainly. Uh, <clears throat> I was born and raised in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and when I was about <clears throat> in the sixth grade, 11 years old, I woke up one morning, and guess what? I was going to become a military fighter pilot. Well, at the mention of that, my mother, who looked at me, and isn't it strange how your mother can look at you and say, he has all this wonderful talent, when I had no talent whatsoever, <laughs> but they could see things that no one else could see. So I sat on that piano stool for the first uh, 10 years of my life or so. And then in the sixth grade, 11 years old, I decided I was going to become a military pilot. Don't ask me why, don't ask me how. I don't remember seeing a movie about it. But one morning, I woke up and I was bit. So from that point on, it was model airplanes and uh, every book I can fly. I can remember one book in particular. Randolph Hill, Texas. West Point of the Air. And I bet I read that book so many times I almost had it memorized. So when I was 16 years old, I was a soda jerk and I managed to save up $35. I had my uncle take me out to Wold Chamberlain and I went up to a fixed base operator and said, hey, I want to take flying lessons. So they said, sure, that will get you five. Well, I got the five on a little tail dragger, a little J3 Piper Cub. You know what they look like. Well, I don't know if you do or not. As young as you guys are, you don't see J3s flying very often. But nevertheless, that's the way it was. No more money and uh, no more flying lessons. And of course, uh, in 1941, we know the war started. But keep in mind that uh, during back in those days, uh, after President Roosevelt decided to train us guys back in March of 1941, and the first class was started in July of 1941. They wanted people to have some college experience. But it didn't take long before they had just about wiped out all of the guys with college experience. They said, hey, we'll open it up for you high school kids. You can pass the physical, pass the, the uh, physical and the mental exams, we'll take you in. So at 17 years of age, I graduated from high school, June 42. I go bebopping down to the local recruitment station and say, hey, I want to sign up. Great, sign on the dotted line, set for the exam, scored reasonably high. And I say, hey, I'm on my way. But interesting enough, they said, no, no, not yet. Everyone else, and I'm the only guy looking like this sitting there, and there's about 100 other guys, they were all sworn into the reserve, and they were obviously protected from the draft. But my paperwork had to go to Washington, D.C. So I sat there sweating after I turned 18. The draft is going to get me before I get my chance to go fly. But fortunately, in December, I was selected, and I finally wound up in the military, graduating class of 1944. 19 years old, the hottest thing that ever said good morning to an airplane. <laughs> but that was also a joke. Do you know why they send young guys off, off to fight wars? How the old generals kind of sit there and select all of you young guys to go off to fight the war. You know why they do that? You guys are invincible, aren't you? <laughs> oh, you guys will live forever. Nothing bad will ever happen to you. But guess what? One day, you too will also sweat it out. But I could go on and keep yakety yakety yakety. I don't want to take up too much time. So uh, does anyone have any questions? Now come on, you guys, ROTC, you got 10,000 questions. So give me one. Colonel Brown, the gentleman to the one left. One question. Colonel Brown, the gentleman to the left. <laughs> the gentleman to the left. Yes. What is it?
Well, I wish I had a pair of wings to fly, to be quite honest. <laughs> but unfortunately, that was not the case. But let me tell you just a little bit like that, if I can take a few minutes. Uh, one of the biggest hazards uh, of flying missions were if you were ever hit, you were always brief to get out of the target area, and rightly so. Whether you're escorting bombers off on a street for mission or whatever, there were a bunch of people down there. Not that you're aiming trying to kill people, but shrapnel stuff flying all over the place. So all of a sudden you get hit, you're in your chute. Now, can you imagine what those guys are thinking about after you just about wiped out some guy's brother, another guy's wife, and all the rest of it, and here you come floating down in a parachute. Those are some very angry people, and rightly so. And to follow that up on just a little bit, two more minutes is all I'll take. Uh, I was shot down on my 30th mission, and... Uh, Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> I was shot. Alexander just gives me a rough time down here. Uh, I was shot down on my 30th mission, and uh, one of the unfortunate things, I did not get out of the target area. I was picked up almost immediately, brought back to a little yeah. village, and I was met by 35 of the most angriest people you have ever seen in your life. Yeah. And there was no doubt they had murder on their mind and they made certain that I knew what they were going to do. Now here I was, 20 years old, looking like this, no business being up in Germany, and I got a mob of 35 or so people looking at me, and they wanted a piece of me. Fortunately, there was a good person in the crowd, a constable that came up, put around his rifle, and prevented them from taking my life. But for a very short while, those first 35 minutes or so, I was frightened to death. There wasn't a doubt in my mind I was going to die. I couldn't run. I couldn't hide. I couldn't do anything. As a matter of fact, I think I was talking to myself for a while. Harold, what are you going to do? I don't know what I'm going to do. Well, think of something, Harold. You aren't going to just sit here and let them kill you. I said, yeah, but that's what's going to happen to me. But that was the most frightening thing that ever happened to me. I was looking death straight in the eye. And at 20 years old, I had a whole lot of living to do. But from that point on, POW, and if you get in the POW camp, that was actually a safe haven, really. And I'll just cut it off there. I could go in and tell you 10,000 stories, but uh, I think you get the picture. Thanks, sir. Thank you. Mm -hmm. for, for those that did not hear the exchange, when Colonel Brown said he was shot down on his 30th mission, Colonel Jefferson said, welcome to the club. So for those that did not hear that, <laughs> he said lack of time. I, I just feel like uh, I'd like to hear Colonel Brown lecture a time or two. <laughs> Our next panelist is uh, Lieutenant Colonel George Hardy from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I don't know if he's a fan of the Philadelphia Eagles or not, which is not. Yeah, uh, yeah I was born and raised in Philadelphia and graduated from high school in 1942. Mm. I turned 17 that same month, so I had to wait a year to get into the service. But in March of 43, I took the aviation cadet exam to go to Tuskegee and passed it. And they sent me home until I turned 18, and I entered the service in July of 43. Went through flying school in December 43 and graduated in September 44. After additional training, I ended up going overseas, 99th Fighter Squadron, flying a P-51. 19 years old, had my Rolls Royce. Mm -hmm. and, uh, it was beautiful. It was. Uh, uh -huh. But I came back after the war, and I got out in 46, and. Uh, Went to NYU for one year and was recalled in 48. Well, in 48 is when racial integration uh, started, at least the Air Force. Air Force was formed in September 1947. Seven months later, the Air Force said they were going to integrate racially. And uh, Truman signed the executive order in July. I went back in and went into maintenance uh, school at Keister for 50 weeks. 
became a maintenance officer in electronics. Well, in 1949, when I graduated, racial integration had taken place in the, in the, Army, in the Air Force. And I was assigned to the 19th Bomb Group on Guam, a B-29 outfit as a maintenance officer. But I learned to fly the airplane and check down in it, and in 1950, I was put on a combat crew as a co-pilot. When the Korean War started, we flew over Korea. Uh, the first mission on the 30th of June, 1950, very early in the war. But there were still racial problems in those days. In March of 19, no, in May of 1950, got a new squadron commander who wouldn't speak to me except in the line of duty because he didn't believe in racial integration. And when we went up to Okinawa and started flying on our 12th of July 7th combat mission, at the last minute he pulled me off the airplane and replaced me. He didn't want me flying in his outfit. That was the first B-29 shot down over North Korea. Beagle. My crew was in it and I didn't go down with them. Uh, but anyway, I survived that period and ended up flying. Uh, I got a new squadron commander after that because my squadron commander went to be deputy group commander and a new commander put me back on flying status. So I ended up flying 45 missions, B-29s over Korea. Came back to the States in SAC and uh, had a good time in SAC at several bases, even Carswell and Limestone, Maine. And I say I grew up in the service because from Limestone I went to the Institute of Technology for two years and got a BS in electrical engineering. And from there I went to Japan, had a good tour, made major over there, maintenance, uh, maintenance supervisor, armored electronic maintenance squadron. Our airplanes were the British Canberra bombers, third bomb wing. From there I went to Plattsburgh, New York. Ended up a squadron, cause major made it squadron commander, armored electronics maintenance squadron. And my wing commander was that same officer who pulled me off the airplane in Okinawa. He was now my wing commander. I was with him for two years, for three years up there. And it's the best three years of my career under him the second time. I love working for him the second time. I love to see people change, whatnot. But I would have stayed with him forever, but Institute of Technology let me know there's a new graduate level program they were gonna put into effect. They wanted to do it right away. And they didn't have time to advertise for it, so they went back to prior graduates, and my name came up, and they offered me the chance to go to Wright Pat. I went there in February 63 for 19 months and ended up with a master's in systems engineering. Reliability was the field, that, a new field that they came out, and I ended up with a master's degree in that. So I grew up in the service. From there, I got a job at Hanscom Air Force Base in procurement and whatnot. And I made lieutenant colonel up there. And for three and a half years, I was chief of engineering and program manager for the 490L Overseas Audubon Program. Automatic voice network, Department of Defense first direct dial telephone system. Three and a half years, I was chief of engineering and, and uh, program manager for that. The first switches cut over in June of 1969. But I'd been up at Hanscom for five and a half years. And they pre prepared a new gunship, 119K. They made a gunship out of it. It was a two carrier airplane that uh, carried 42 paratroopers, could let them out two at a time, but they made a gunship out of it in Vietnam. And they looked for pilots who had flown that airplane. I had hundreds of hours in the 119. And I was recalled to active duty as a pilot and ended up going to Vietnam in 1970. I was a lieutenant colonel. Our airplane, our squadron was at Phan Rang, but all the airplanes were at board operating locations, Udo in Thailand and Da Nang. I trained with the crew, but when I went overseas, they took the crew away from me, and I became the commander at Da Nang and uh, at uh, Udorn and then later at Da Nang. I ended up flying 70 combat missions in Korea, in, uh, in Vietnam, in a gunship. I came back and retired in 1971. And anyway, I say that I grew up, I was educated in the service. Someone was looking out over me. I never had to bail out of an airplane. And so, as I say, I was in someone's good graces. I thank God for that. Anyway, that's the sum total of my career. But the thing is, when I retired, because of my degrees, 
I retired on a Friday, I interviewed a GT on a Monday, and they made me a job offer. And I worked for them for 18 months, for 18 years. So I say I had the best of everything as far as a service, and I'm grateful for that. If we Any have questions? questions for Colonel Hardy, would someone stand? We'll bring a microphone to you. Right, okay, all the way up. Just a second, Colonel Hardy. Just. Yes, ma'am. Good day, gentlemen. My name is Lakeisha Holligan. I'm the Assistant Director of Military and Veterans Affairs at Florida A&M University. And I do have a, a question for you all. In your age now, how do you stay so sharp and so witty. What was that question again? How do, we How do you stay so <laughs> How do we look? So what? Touche indeed, Colonel Hardy. How do you say <laughs> so sharp and witty? That's for the entire panel, I believe. That's Well, you know, I'm 93, inward. And so I know how hard it is to get around, do things like that. Age catches up with everyone. And it's catching Holy up with us, too. Surely. What? Slowly but You're surely. You're right. Just catching up. <laughs> Any other questions? I, I, I have one for Colonel Hardy. I mean, if we could be reflective for a moment from World War II to Korea to the Cuban Missile right Crisis to Vietnam, uh, your experiences leading up to Vietnam, how did they help you, sir? Well, the thing is, when I look back at this thing of Vietnam, I was able to adapt to everything. But the thing is, when when I look at the totality of my career, in World War II, they would never have anyone of African ancestry over a Caucasian. But then, at the end of my career in Vietnam, I was a detachment commander, and all of my pilots were white. So it shows that evolution, how things went in the service. And I still meet with those guys. At the, they have, still have reunions, some of them. But I was 45 then. They're all at least 20 years younger than me. Mm -hmm. But I get along with them very well. Yeah. Thank you. Our, yes, yes, absolutely. Please. Well done. Well done. Our fourth panelist is Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Jefferson, whose grandfather was one of the founding fathers at Morehouse University. His favorite place to vacation is in Hawaii. So hopefully he'll tell us what he likes to do in Hawaii. So uh, Colonel Jefferson, let's yield the floor to you, sir. So tell us a little bit about yourself and your history with armed forces. Good. Somebody often asks, why the hell did you go to the Army? Now remember now, 1941, World War II was kicking out. I graduated from Clark College in June 42. The draft was biting me, uh, boom, 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 boom. So the first thing I did, went down from Detroit, went down to the Federal Building, and joined. I thought they were going to send me to Tuskegee because we were segregated, and all the training was at Tuskegee. No, they said, hell no, go home and we'll call you. Put me on a list. Took me almost nine months before they called me. Now remember now, I'm a graduate, I'm a Clark College graduate, and I'm in the last class going to Tuskegee of college blacks who are college graduates because the Army, Navy, Marines were grabbing black men with college degrees. Uh, the classes after me went to, 30, to three, years, three months of, of uh, college training detachment. I, was, I graduated in January 44 from Tuskegee as a second lieutenant. We were sent to Selfridge Air Force Base, fly the P-39, because the three sections, the three squadrons were the 301st, the 302nd, and the 99th. These three squadrons of blacks were flying P-39s up and down the shores outside of Italy. And my class, was, we were supposed to be replacements for them. And we were trained in P-39s at Selfridge Air Force Base until 
something like the March of 44, 45, 44. We had a two-star general come to Selfridge. I'm out over Lake Huron, air gunnery. All officers report to the post theater on the double, which means drop everything you're doing and get you behind into post theater. We were there, blacks and, blacks and white officers mixing, trying to find out what the hell's going on. Nobody knows what the hell's going on. All of a sudden, somebody said, teach up. And we popped to, down the aisle strolled a two-star two general. We are looking at each other and said, what the hell's going on? Man? I don't know. He rambled on and on and on for about four, five, ten minutes. And then I, these are the words I remember. Quote, gentlemen, this is my airfield. As long as I'm in command, there will be no socialization between white and colored officers. Holy jumping crap. We've been trying to get into the officers club. They said, hell no. That was Thursday. Saturday morning, they put us on a train and three, well, th later, th three days later, we ended up at Walterboro, South Carolina. We were in the first class to be shipped over to join the 332nd fighter group. I went into the 301st fighter squadron and I flew 18 and one half missions. <laughs> My 18th missions were escorting the P-51s. We could just got in the P-51s. I'm cutting it short, damn it. And uh, 18th missions, escorting uh, B-17s and B B-24s from Italy to Germany, Italy to France. Hell, I went to Ploesti two or three times. The 19th mission was a strafing mission. First time we came in and strafed. And I'm in the... In the 301st, out of the 16 airplanes, four, four, red, white, yellow, blue. I think, I can't remember it anyway. I'm blue. I'm over here. Now, we're strafing too long. Southern France, radar stations. We did not know that the invasion of southern France came off on August the 15th. Our job was to knock out the radar stations, which controlled the guns firing out to sea. Well, we went in. First flight, second flight, third flight, fourth flight. And on the fourth flight, who's the guy, last guy to go across the target? Me. God damn it. You look up ahead and you see all of this stuff coming back at you. I went right across the top of the target and something said, boom. I said, what the hell is going on? <laughs> Fire came up out of, the, out of the floor. So I had to bail out. Now here we are doing, here we're doing about 400 miles an hour because we pushed everything to the wall. So I said to myself, now remember now, out of ten, ten months, nine months of training, not one minute on how to bail out. <laughs> so you rise to the occasion. <laughs> Pull back on a stick, get some goddamn altitude. <laughs> and as you go up, you reach down on the left side, there's a little wheel that you rotate. Uh, for nose down. If you turn the stick loose, your nose goes down. Pull that sucker up anyway. And as you get up, I don't know how in the hell I got up high. All I know, it got pretty warm. <laughs> I had to get out. So as you're going up, you reach up and pull a little red knob and the goddamn canopy goes off. 
And you get up so high, I don't know how high, but I got kind of warm, so I said, it's just time to go. And turn the stick loose, and when you do, what happens to the nose? Boom, abruptly, because you racked in forward trim tab. And as the, as the tail dropped, I hit, you have straps here with a big buckle, and you hit that buckle, and the goddamn straps come loose. Boom, I'm, I came out. I remember the damn tail going by with all that fire. And somebody said, when you bail out, you go A, B, C. But hell, I looked down the goddamn trees and was so close. <laughs> You reach up and pull that sucker real fast, and when the paper, boom, I'm in the trees. And all of a sudden, I'm sitting trying to get out, and I hear this voice, Oxo, yeah. I said, oh, shit. <laughs> Realistically, German, German guard, and uh, he looked up. And I'm in the trees, and he's helping me get out. And he looks up and sees a little gold bar, and he salutes me. <laughs> and all I can do, return the salute. <laughs> I was introduced to the German, I became a POW, 12th of August, 1944, when, uh, by the time when Harold came in, and during the war, there were 32 men out of the 332nd fighting group who were POWs, 32 of us. And uh, I'm not going to go through the men who died, but that came. We, we spent the rest of the war at Stalag 3, and then Stalag 7 8 came back from the war. I became school teacher, city of Detroit, 30 years, 35 years with mama's dear little stinking snots. <laughs> Lo and behold, I quit. <laughs> Take care, I quit. That's it, thank you. Thank you, Colonel Jefferson. <laughs> I, be, before, before our audience asks a question, I'm just curious, uh, 30 years you're taught, was it in English? Yeah. What subject did you teach? Elementary science. Elementary science. Yes, of course. Obvious. Yes. OK. Uh, do we have anything from our friends on the floor? Would you be so kind to stand and wait on the microphone that's coming towards you? Too bad it wasn't in English. Ulu uh, Shea Shole from Radford University. Uh, my question for the whole entire panel is, how did you overcome racism and discrimination? And what lessons would you mind sharing about that? Who is this one? What the hell do you say? <laughs> Repeat the question one more time. By the way, you're talking to guys up here. We're, every one of us has bad hearing. <laughs> Think about the rages. <laughs> How did you overcome racial uh, discrimination while when you were serving in the service? How did we do it? Overcome. How did you overcome racial discrimination <laughs> over your years of service? And you know, if, if I could follow, what would you? Subsequent to that, with the attitude, that? everybody's stupid except you and me. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I would like to make a comment on that. And sometimes okay. I'm not so sure about you. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to make a comment about that. As after racial integration took place in '49, all of us were shipped out to other outfits. Yeah. And individually, a lot of people ran into problems that you never thought you'd run into discrimination problems. And it hurt some of the fellows in their career-wise. But it was a fact of life. Because there were many people, whites, who didn't agree with racial integration. And if you ran or served, if you served with someone like that, you, you may have paid a price. So. But gradually, the services worked. And I think it, we came out on top. So. It's still going on today. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's bring our fifth panelist in. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel James H. Harvey III from Montclair, New Jersey. And 
I like your boots, sir. So uh, thank you. <laughs> let, let's hear your story. Um, what brought you uh, into the military, sir? Okay, uh, in January of 1943, I tried to enlist in the Army Air Corps. They told me they weren't taking enlistments at that time. That was the height of the war, and uh, I got the picture. They didn't want me. So they drafted me into the Army in uh, April of 1943. Caught the train in Nanticoke, Pennsylvania, heading to Fort Meade, Maryland. Got to Washington, D.C. We had an hour layover, got off the train, went to a restaurant, got something to eat, went back to get on the train, and he says, no way. You're in that car back there. Welcome to the South. Uh, he put me in the car where Negroes rode. It was generally the last car. That was my introduction to segregation. Uh, let me back up now. I was born, I, gotta be, I have to be born. I was born in Montclair, New Jersey in July of 1923. Left uh, New Jersey, went to Pennsylvania in 1936. Went to Wilkesbury, Pennsylvania. And my dad was uh, working there at the Hazard Wire Rope Works. Then we moved to a small town called New Angola Station. That's near Mountaintop, Pennsylvania, which is near Wilkesbury and Hazleton, between Wilkesbury and Hazleton, Pennsylvania. I went to a school, two bit, a two room schoolhouse in the seventh and eighth grades. And uh, then when I went to uh, high school, we had to take a bus, and I was at Mountaintop, Pennsylvania. Now, when we moved out there, <clears throat> we were the only family of color out there. So I did not run into any segregation whatsoever. I was treated just like any other person. So segregation never entered my mind. No problems. Went to high school at Mountaintop, Pennsylvania. We did not have to have, the only sports we had was basketball and a tumbling team. I was the anchorman on the tumbling team and captain of the basketball team. And in my senior year, we had another young lady of color come in. So now there are two of us in the school in my senior year. My senior year, I was class president and valedictorian. I did not know anything about segregation, like I say, until I got into the military. Now, my senior year, I was in my uh, front yard. We were out in the, in the country. We lived in the country. No city at all. Had a house away from the house, if you know what I mean. And uh, I was standing in my yard, and I saw this flight of P-40s fly over in formation. I said to myself, I'd like to do that one day. So I go to Fort Meade, Maryland, get my uniform, my shots, and uh, I checked in. And they sent me to Jefferson Barracks, Missouri, for 30 days of basic training. Finished my basic training, and based on my scores and my written test that I had taken at Fort Meade, Maryland, they put me in the Army Air Corps, engineers, driving bulldozers, graders, carry-alls. My mission was to go into the Pacific, go into the jungle, doze out an area, and build an airfield for aircraft. We used to go out and practice every day. And I said, no, this isn't for me. So I applied for cadet training. There were 10 of us that applied that uh, went to take the exam, nine whites and myself. Two of us passed. And from there, I went to Keesler Field in Biloxi, Mississippi for 30 more days of basic training. I finished that, and off to Tuskegee I went. <clears throat> now, I was a perfectionist when I was growing up. Everything had to be perfect. When I got married, that had to change. <laughs> right. <clears throat> so washing out or failing never entered my mind, because I knew I could do anything they wanted me to do. And that took me all the way through flying school. And uh, I, like I said, I had no problems at all in flying school. Uh, 
I remember one day I was practicing a lazy eight. That's a maneuver. It's an eight on a 45 degree angle between 2,000 and 1,000 feet. You can take any altitude you want, but ours is between 2,000 and 1,000 feet. And I was out practicing, and uh, when I came to the top, I was approaching 2,000 feet mighty fast, so I found myself upside down. But the altimeter said 2,000 feet. But uh, I still had to practice because the instructor didn't want any of that kind of stuff. Everything we did in our, at Tuskegee had to be perfect. So we learned to fly the aircraft. Now the white pilots, I think all they had to do was demonstrate that they could get the aircraft off the ground and back on safely. Our program, flying training program, was designed for our failure. They knew there wouldn't be anyone graduating to man the 99th fighter squadron. They knew that without a doubt, but we proved them otherwise. I graduated from flying school in October uh, the 16th, 1944. And from there went to uh, no, pardon me, Walterboro, South Carolina for combat training. I finished my combat training in April of 1945. Had my bags packed, within one hour catching the train to go to Norfolk to catch a ship to go over and join the, the group over in Europe. We got a message saying to hold us. So I, like I said, an hour before I was ready to go. We got this message saying to hold us, so I didn't go. That was in April of 45. Hitler gave up the following month of May of 45. So I would have been on the high seas. In, in uh, May of 1949, we had the first ever Top Gun weapons meet where Harry Stewart uh, Captain Temple and myself were members, and we won the meet. But then the following month of June, they started full integration of the military. They declared they were going to integrate the military in 48, but nothing really happened until they broke our group up in June of 48. And they scattered us, and they scattered us all over the world. Eddie Drummond, who was in the 99th, he and I had an assignment to Misawa, Japan. So we, before we left, our records had been forwarded to Misawa, Japan. So the group commander knew who was coming. So, or I should say the wing commander. So the wing commander called all the pilots into the base theater before we got there. He said, we have these two Negro pilots coming in and they'll be assigned to one of the squadrons. Well, the pilots told us this themselves. They said, no way are we going to fly with them. No way. So anyway, Eddie Drummond and I reported into the wing commander, sitting in his office talking. And he said, uh, what do you want us to call you? This is a military organization. What do you want us to call you? I said, well, I'm a first lieutenant. Eddie Drummond's a second lieutenant. How about Lieutenants Harvey and Drummond? He said, okay. But then he made us a mistake. He said, we have three fighter squadrons on the base, two P-51 squadrons and an F-80 squadron. That's the jet. Which one do you want to go to? That's a no-brainer. I said, the F-80. So he put us both in the F-80 squadron. Now, they did not have a T-33, which is a F-80 jet trainer. They did not have one. But they did have a couple AT6s. That's what we flew in advance. And we flew them for instrument training for the F-80. Get in the back seat and you pull this hood up, you can't see out. All you have are your instruments. So Eddie and Drummond and I, we both had two flights in the back seat of an AT-6. Now what they would do, I'd get in the back seat, the pilot up front would get instructions for takeoff. In the meantime, I've got the hood up before we taxi out, I've got the hood up in place, and all I can see are my instruments. The pilot up front lines up on the runway. He says, you've got it. So I throttle forward, take off, pull up the gear, the flap, prop picks, pitch, mixture control, all that good stuff. 
and I fly around doing maneuvers he wants me to do. Then it's time to land. I call ground control approach. And they vectored me in for a landing. I touched down, and the pilot up front took over. And I had two flights like that. What does that have to do with flying the F-80? Nothing. I finally figured out why they had us do that. They wanted to see if we could fly. We proved we could. I knew that. Mm -hmm. They had doubts. But we, we showed them that, yes, we could fly just like anybody else. And I was in Masao, Japan. And I came back to the States, went to Victorville, California, well, Korea. Korea started um, when I was in Japan. We immediately started flying missions the next day after the invasion. And I flew uh, 126 missions in the F-80 and then uh, rotated back to Masawa, Japan. I started flying the day after the invasion started and I had 126 missions by December, by Christmas Day, December, December 25th. In the meantime, the wing commander had been asking Far Eastern Air Force Command for a cutoff in the number of missions that the pilots flew. And nothing would come down. Finally, it came down 100 missions, so I did not have to fly anymore. Rotated back to Masao, Japan. That was in December of 50. Then came back to the States in uh, April of uh, 51. I went, to, I went to George Air Force Base in Victorville, California. And there uh, I was an assistant, assistant operations officer, instrument instructor pilot, and test pilot. Now, I'll have to say that I did not have any problems during my whole career in the military as far as being a minority, none whatsoever. Even the guys that were in uh, the squadron in Masawa, Japan, the ones that said they were not going to fly with us, they found out that we were good. We were very good. We were better than they were. Uh, like The reason we were so good as a group is because of our training. Everything they did, the instructor did, was trying to wash us out. And it just made us better pilots. Like I said, everything had to be perfect. We were good. We were the best. We proved it overseas that we were the best. And then we came back to the States. We had the weapons meet in 49. We won that. We proved we were the best there. So I, I, I like to use the word best. I don't know if you noticed that or Colonel not. Colonel Harvey, what year did you retire, sir? Anyway, I uh, retired in Truax in Madison, Wisconsin in uh, May of 1949. Now, before I retired, I had a family to, re to support. So before I retired, I started looking for a job. United, I interviewed with United uh, Airlines. They didn't want me mm -hmm. because of my color. So they didn't want any passengers getting on the airplane and see a dark face in the cockpit. And Madison, Wisconsin was the home office for Oscar Mayer. So I interviewed with Oscar Mayer, got a job as a salesman. However, I was supposed to be at the plant for three months, learning the operation from slaughter through finished product, all the products. I was there a month, and they needed a salesman in northern New Jersey, so I went there as a salesman, was there for three years, went to Detroit as a uh, um, assistant sales manager, uh, or district manager, rather. And I was there for 18 months, then to Philadelphia, to the plant in Philadelphia as an assistant sales manager. I was there for three years. Then I got a promotion to Denver and as a center, as a center manager, and I was there center manager from 73 until uh, February of 1980, retired from Oscar Mayer in February 1980. Colonel Harvey, if I may, um, I'd like to uh, yield to the floor. Do we have any questions for Colonel Harvey before I see someone? Yes, ma'am. Oh, give it just a second, the microphone. You'll have to relay, <laughs> like Jefferson. You like? <laughs> really? <laughs> Don't you love the detail of 1944, 1945? They, they know this. Everything. Good morning, gentlemen. Uh, my name is Vanny Zwanek. I'm from uh, Texas A&M University. Uh, what was it like coming back to areas in the country where there was still segregation? 
Can I repeat the question, gentlemen? What was it like in areas where there was segregation? What was it like to live? Where I was Station. living? Sir? What was it like to live in like an to era come back of home. segregation? Yeah, yeah, when you came, the, to, oh. she asked, what was it like to live in an area where there was segregation when you came back home or where you were stationed? What was it like to live in areas of segregation? Oh, it, it didn't bother me at all. Uh, <laughs> they had their problem, and I ignored their problem. But it didn't, I didn't let it bother me. Maybe that's wrong. Nothing in life bothers me. I just go with the flow. <laughs> okay, let's get to our final panelist. Uh, he's our closer for uh, this day. It's Lieutenant Colonel Harry Stewart from Newport News, Virginia. So that makes me think either he was going to build a ship or fly a plane, so he chose to fly a plane. So Colonel Stewart, let's hear your story, sir. I uh, see you looking at your watch, and I just wanted to find out how much time do I have. If, uh, uh, we'll yield uh, whatever you like, sir. Well, thank you. I well, won't take more than a half hour, all right? <laughs> okay. Anyway, I'm going to preempt some of the questions that might be asked of me, maybe two questions, all right? And uh, that question would have to do with uh, what were the greatest things that happened to me while I was in the uh, service there? Well, I'd say the second greatest thing was 75 years ago, plus or minus a few months, I met these guys here. And uh, it was, it was quite, an, uh, quite an event for me. And it's been a, a lasting love affair for, uh, for the past 75 years. Uh, of the combat pilots, there are uh, 13 of us left. And uh, we still try to keep in contact with one another. But right on the stage, you see uh, the uh, remainder uh, of the portion of that uh, 13. But anyway, getting back to the question, what were the greatest things that happened to me in the service? And uh, that, that was uh, one of them. That was the second greatest thing. Uh, I'd like to say is that the, uh, uh, these gentlemen, Colonel Friend over there on the end, who was the uh, first panelist there, he was born in uh, uh, Columbia, South Carolina, but he was raised in Manhattan, the borough of Manhattan, New York. And you introduced me as being born in Newport News, Virginia, and I was raised in the borough of Queens in New York there. So we were over, distance apart over the uh, East River here as far as, but I didn't know him before I went into the service. Uh, he was operations officer in the 301st Fighter Squadron, and when I went over there, he had already gotten about uh, 100 missions uh, under his belt. He was serving his uh, second tour. But anyway, the war ended uh, in uh, May of uh, 1945, and we all of us got on the boat together, and we came back from Italy, uh, uh, landed in Staten Island, and uh, Bob Friend, Colonel Friend over there, he went home to, with his family in Manhattan there, and I took the subway and went home to my uh, family in, uh, in, in Queens. Uh, I guess I was home for about two days and I got a call from Colonel Friend and he says, Harry, he said, uh, I'd like you to come on over and uh, meet my family in Manhattan here. So I went over and met his family and little did I know that this would end up to a 68 year marriage to his sister. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I call him, I call him Cupid because he did the same thing with his, uh, another one of his sisters there. <laughs> Brought one of the Tuskegee Airmen home and introduced them and they were married. So a question that I got from somebody when I mentioned this story before is he said, well, how many times did Cupid do this again? And Cupid answered, None. And they said, why? And he said, I ran out of sisters. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that was the greatest things that happened to me while, while I was in the service there. Tell me. Wait, 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 wait. Yes, no, there's one other thing. You shot down three airplanes in one mission. OK. OK, you didn't mention that on one mission. Three airplanes in one up, mission. It's up there. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I want to make sure they heard that, OK. For those that might be stringing, they can't see the distinguished flying cross. <laughs> Can we, we have just a, a question or two before we have, okay, so I, let's start to the gentleman who has his in black all the way up in that, in that direction, and now I'll come back to the middle. Just one or two questions. 
There's a microphone coming towards you, sir. Hi, Colonel. My name is Ray Simon. I'm an artist. But one of the questions I wanted to ask you, in both all of you guys, have you ever looked at yourself as a civil rights movement yet to come? I mean, in, in all reality, as history proceeded, you guys were the trailblazers. I was talking to Colonel Friend and Colonel Jefferson yesterday and almost laid the path for Ruby Bridges, Rosa Parks, and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And what I find interesting is the March 24th, 1945 mission to the Daimler-Benz tank factory. It was 20 years in one day, which was 1965, March 25th, where Dr. Martin Luther King walked across the bridge to vote. So have you ever, my question to you is, have you ever looked at yourself, all of you, as a civil rights movement yet to come? You, you didn't protest, you didn't march, what you guys did was did, and you became some of the best pilots in the country. Somebody had well, to do it. I, I've, been, I've been asked that question a, a, a number of times, and um, while we were going through training, and I think that the, uh, the other panelists will attest to this, is that I don't think we dreamed at that time that we were making an impact no. on you know, the future of uh, what was happening as far as racial integration was concerned and that type of thing. We thought we were doing our job as uh, citizens of the United States and performing as uh, soldiers uh, in, in, in the military. It wasn't until maybe uh, 19, in the 19, late 1970s and even more recent when two films came out, uh, and, uh, 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 one was called the Tuskegee Airmen, which had worldwide distribution, and it was put out by uh, HBO, and the second was The Red Tails, which was a Lucas film that was uh, put out by uh, George Lucas. Uh, anyway, uh, they got worldwide distribution, and at around that time, as uh, all sorts of inquiries started coming in, as far as, you know, we'd like to hear from you guys and what you did and give us a rundown on the history of the organization that you were in and that type of thing. So uh, to answer the question again is that no, I don't think we realized how much impact we were going to make on uh, integration while we were in the service there, but uh, uh, this became readily apparent after we came out of the service and we got more notoriety. I think but, I heard Colonel Jefferson said someone was, had to do it, right? Seriously. I was satisfying something inside of me. I wanted to fly. I flew, caught all kinds of hell. But let's face it, that's what was going on as a black person in this country. And I came out after the war, put all my stuff together, red tail captured, red tail free. I wrote this book, and it was high highly accepted, but it was something on the inside of me that made, made me learn to fly. And uh, teaching school, I felt that somewhere young black men needed to learn how to fight the system. The system is vicious. And unless you know how to cope with the vicious system, you got nothing. And when I taught school, well, to tell you something, we had things called safety patrols, remember? Where a little kid had a white belt and had the responsibility of patrolling or covering that corner. Well, in order to be a safety, you had to be a nerd. <laughs> That's number one. And to a black teenager, or a black kid, telling him at that time to be a nerd was a no-no. Ostracization. You had to be on time. Colonel Davis demanded us to be on time. When Colonel Davis said, be in my office, at 0900, you don't show up at 9 o'clock. What time do you show up? 8.45. You're damn right. <laughs> As a safety patrol, you had to be on that corner at least 10 minutes ahead of time. 
all of a sudden you're teaching a 12-year-old to be on time. When you come in the school building, you take off your hat. Teaching young men how to cope with the system. Women teachers come to the door, and a 12 or 13-year-old opens the door. What do you teach him? Manners, slowly but surely. These are the kinds of things in the back of my mind. And learning how to fly, hell, that's satisfied. Oh, hell. They, they said landing was only, oh, this, oh, that's a joke I can't tell. <laughs> Uh, Colonel Jefferson, Jefferson, if I may, for, for the audience to ask questions, you'll address the panel yeah. um, after the presentation. Good enough. Uh, I'd like to, uh, we, we have something uh, special coming, so uh, thank you for your time. Uh, reminded of, a, of uh, something about Man. timeliness. To be early Man. is to be on time. To be on time is to be late. May I, I say mean, something? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, I think it, it's very important <clears throat> for uh, especially the, the cadets to appreciate the fact that you don't have to be a pilot in order to be in the oh, Air yeah. Force. The Air Force has an awful wide range of activities that people are getting involved in. You can do both, be readying yourself as a pilot, but at the same time, selecting for your career something else, for instance, I was in tech intelligence, and in tech intelligence, I was responsible for those kinds of things that you can anticipate from an electrical office. I went through lots and lots of, of schooling, lots of schooling, uh, yeah, at least 10 years of schooling, and you'd be happy with that. You could, that's a real life, real life. And uh, if you can get into flying, if you like flying, that's fine. I liked flying, got into flying, and had a good time. But I also recognize that the Air Force needs people other than pilots. These other people are the ones who are responsible for pilots, like those crew chiefs that we had, they too had to understand they have the same appreciation for dedication to a subject. It, when I came down and got that airplane, I, he used to walk over to me and say, where, do, where are we going today, we? And when I came back, he would say, what did you do to our airplane? Colonel <laughs> Friend, that will be and I recognize a lot of things that happen, won't be the final like word. the guys are talking here. You know, like, for instance, uh, uh, when a young man down there told you all how he bailed out, I watched him do it. I was right behind him. <laughs> OK. <laughs> so, please, please remain seated. Please remain seated. We have a presentation by Mr. Roberts. First of all, thank you very much uh, for uh, really one of the highlights, uh, not only of our day, but I suspect the highlights of our lives in meeting, listening to not just American heroes, they are world heroes. They have stood up, taken responsibility for themselves and for others. So on behalf of a former Air Force guy who was not a pilot, I want to express my appreciation for your leadership for the example that you have set, for your bravery, and for your dedication. Thank you very much.